Welcome to the latest episode of Five on the Floor on the Five Reasons Sports Network. Thanks for joining us on your favorite podcast app. We're on Podbean, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts. We're also on Dash Radio on their Nothing But Net channel every single weeknight at 7 p.m. Also, check out Five Reasons YouTube. That's where you can find Post Up 5R, hosted by Royal Shepherd as soon as the game ends. Before Floor, an hour before every game begins. That's hosted by me. Also, check out FiveReasonsSports.com. Make sure you spell that one out. The latest takeaways from Brady Hawk and others. There is no paywall. And finally, the great sponsors of the Five Reasons Sports Network. Make sure you're using our product code. It's 5RSN. That's the number 5RSN. You get 10% off if you're an endurance athlete of any kind or simply if you sweat at GetSalis.com. That's G-E-T-S-A-L-I-S.com. Or if you're looking for premium CBD, whether it's the the gummies, the tincture, the sports cream, go to TherapistPreferred.com, 25% off. And again, the code, the number 5 RSN. And now, tonight's episode. Down to this gang. Yay. Uh, five on the floor. Ride for my dogs. Where here's the thing. You can check the score. Hustle hard, couple scars, wearing bubble frogs. Just like Buck the said, you in trouble, y'all. Kept the floor playing. Got an all band. Y'all seen the block. Stop with one hand. And Pat, we trust. It's power, have the guts. We here to bring the heat. Y'all can hang it up. Welcome to Five on the Floor, a daily insider show on the Miami Heat and the NBA featuring Ethan Skolnick, Greg Sylvander, and Alex Toledo, plus others from the Five Reasons Sports Network. Welcome back to Five on the Floor. I am your host, Greg Sylvander. Tonight's floor plan with me is Brady Hawk. You can follow him at Brady Hawk 305 and Alex Toledo. You can follow him at Tropical Blanket. Uh, as I said, yes, the floor plan is we are going to uh, dissect the Miami Heat's victory over the Cleveland Cavaliers. It's the first of a back to back. I think there's some pretty impactful things to take from this game. Actually, I think it's more informative than a lot of the games we've seen recently, quite frankly. Uh, so w- we're going to get into um, what we saw from the Heat as well as from Cleveland. Uh, and then maybe at the end, look ahead to tomorrow night's matchup against Minnesota. Uh, So the Miami Heat ended uh, the season or ended this game 117-105. It looked a little weird there for a while, guys. Um, It was kind of one of those annoying games where they felt like Cleveland kept clawing back. But there were some, uh, I mean, one, the fact that they that they actually held Cleveland off, extended a lead, really got going in the second quarter or in the third quarter. I thought that all that was really key. Watching Bam obviously was great. Cleveland has done a fantastic job recently of keeping teams off the free throw line. That was not the case tonight. Uh, The Miami Heat got 27 free throw attempts, which was actually two less than what Cleveland got. But um, I definitely think there's a lot of stuff to unpack here about this game. Uh, Miami had yet to beat Cleveland this season. So I think it's also... Um, good to see them, you know, have some success against the team with length. Uh, Brady, I'm sure your takeaways are already up on the site. I have not had the chance to read them. So unprompted um, coming to you first. Uh, what was your uh, major takeaways um, from this game before we kind of get into player by player? Yeah. To, aside from the player by player, I think it's just, what was it? A 26 to four run in the third. It was just like an incredible number. And the thing is, is that we look at that, run and we kind of pointed the offense I think about they had like 27 points total in the third 20 of those were from Bam and Butler I think that's a big part of that is because when you're able to have uh, those two guys step up offensively Jimmy had like back-to-back steals end up going the other direction it got back-to-back transition dunks the way that Bam was able to get going I'm sure we'll get into that obviously a little bit more but it's the ability to hold a Cavs team for that type of uh, stretch of time to four points six points uh That's kind of what stands out because when we talk about an ability to make runs, that ties into that. Like when you're able to also not let the other team go on a run and stop them in that way that I just felt like we talk about the length that they provide and we think about it from an offensive standpoint that maybe they can guard them in different ways. But it was interesting to me to see the way that they were able to throw different things at Garland and throw them off. What I know his stat line ended up being uh, kind of 17 from the field which is wild because it didn't feel like they totally stopped him in any way. Cause first of all, he got to the line 16 times, which is wild. Uh, but they actually like were able to get past what they did early on. They were blitzing him a ton. He was able to kind of slip by and get in the lane, the teeth of defense, they were fouling him. 
later on, they just started, they were a lot more choosy about it where they didn't just totally blitz every time they were just doing different things defensively that I felt like was just different than what we've seen. Like they got away from their game plan in a way that we just really haven't seen them do. And I think that tells you a lot heading into, you know, late in the season into playoff time, because you're going to see a lot of guys like Garland. Like if we think of Boston, these perimeter guys in Chicago, these perimeter guys, the ability to kind of just get guys off their game and maybe adjust mid game. I feel like we know Spo does that already, but just, I guess just seeing it now. Uh, but I guess in general, it's just the ability to make runs and spark them, this team uh, that I just feel like we look at Max Struess tonight and we're, we're, I'm sure we're going to talk about him, but his role in a playoff series is if the offense isn't rolling, just throw Max Struess in there, see if he can get something going. Maybe Gabe Vincent, throw him in, just see if he can get something going. And I think that's the beauty of this depth of this team is that they really do have a lot of guys that can spark things, but also they have guys that can spark things defensively and kind of just stop you in this way and hold you to six points in a quarter. Ignitability. That's what I think Spolster, uh, Eric Spolster calls it. And they're doing it. You're right, Brady. They're doing it on offense and defense. And I'm actually going to, um, going to hold at the point guard position. You mentioned Darius Garland. Um, he's their point guard, right? Are we, we're, we're not, we're not doing that thing where, um, I mean, 10 assists, seven turnovers, uh, he's their lead guard. We'll say that for sure. Um, but I, I'm actually looking at it from Miami's perspective, Alex, what's up with Kyle Lowry. I want to talk about his game tonight because um, 32 minutes got into some early foul trouble. Spolstra uh, kept him in the game when he had four fouls in the third quarter. Um, only one of four from the field kind of just looks disjointed, but still had 10 assists ended up with only three turnovers. Um, what am I supposed to take from this Kyle Lowry game, Alex? Like, cause to me, I was ready to pile on Kyle a little bit tonight, like as the game was unfolding and then it completely flipped the script. So I'm interested to hear your perspective on Kyle's night. Well, I guess this is one of those things where it's kind of, do you look at it optimistically or pessimistically? Because if you look at it pessimistically, it's like, he's on a trend of taking less shots. He's, you know, he, he's not necessarily looked great as a scorer, but it hasn't really mattered so much this season because the, they've gotten a lot from the team as a whole and their depth. Uh, they've also, you know, they got the, the leap from Tyler. You've got a, a little bit of a scoring leap from Bam. So it hasn't stood out as much, but it, it's it's been bothersome to me because I really do appreciate what he does for the offense as a playmaker. You know, he just racks up another 10 assists tonight. It's not a big deal. You know, that's what he does. But it's, I think you always want a little bit more from somebody making $30 million. And it's just, and it's not about the contract. I feel like I'd never bring up contracts on this show, but I, I just think when, when you're bringing up guys um, who you empower and have the ball in your hands so much, I think you want to see them put up shots more, especially a guy like Lowry, who, you know, before the heat brought him on, one of the biggest, I think, reasons you wanted to bring him on was to kind of be uh, somewhat of a drop killer in the sense that he's actually willing to take those jump shots when they're there. And understanding that he's not going to necessarily take a pull-up three after bringing the ball down the floor, that's not really his game, but to be willing to shoot more. Because I think, you know, I, I, the optimistic way of looking at it is he's kind of cruising a little bit. Not that he's not trying out there, but in the sense that he's not really giving it his all on the offensive end where it feels like if he has to, he'll step it up from a, from a um, volume of shots angle. But the Lowry thing to me is he's still playing his game. It's just a little bothersome to, to see him finish with four or five attempts every other game now. Yeah, no, I mean, you're hitting on something because since he's been back only two and a half attempts from three where he's typically, you know, up around five, six a game. Um, so I think that that's collectively the fan yeah, base. Good. They, they want to see Kyle do a little bit more because I think we all know he's capable of it. So um, I, I don't, I, I think that, and you don't ever bring up contracts. So this isn't about like how much money he makes and stuff like that. It's just more about when you see the team needing an offensive jolt or a defensive jolt or whatever the case may be, you expect it to come from somebody. And, um, and Kyle obviously didn't do it the scoring way, but, uh, but rounded out his game. It's funny. Like, just like you mentioned, he had 10 assists and I'm kind of brushing it off. Like what's wrong with Kyle. That's the beauty of having a, a QB one, the way that the heat do now um, let's pivot to bam. This was um, and on our uh, subscription content off the floor. Ethan pointed this out that he couldn't recall a game where Bam played this well and this aggressively 
when Jimmy and Tyler were both in. And I started to rack my brain on that because, I mean, you're not just talking about 16 field goal attempts on efficiency, eight free throw attempts, 17 rebounds, three steals, a block, a partridge in a pear tree. I mean, like dude was killing it. Um, the, the dunk on whoever that uh, dude that we shall not name um, where Tyler threw it up and he kind of, you know, uh, dunked right on his head and Tyler got the technical. I felt like that's when the game flipped, like it woke Cleveland up a little bit. Uh, Brady, let's talk about no ceiling bam out of bio because tonight, I think this was actually probably one of his best games all season, right? Yeah, definitely. And I feel like it's not only the points and everything, it's just the way he did it because every time we see him have a 30 point game, Obviously, the games against Brooklyn stands out or different ones like that. But it's usually because there's a drop big that's kind of sitting there and he's taking a jumper and it falls early and he gets going. Uh, maybe he's being you know unleashed as a roller. The way he was doing it tonight was that he was just working the interior where like they were just getting him the ball really low. He was posting, he was sealing, he was getting it. Uh, it felt like every time he got down there, he threw up a pump fake that got Mobley in the air and he just went up and dunked it afterward like, they did not realize that, that Bam's bump fake was coming because it just kept getting him easy buckets. But it is the eight free throw attempts. It's the ability down there to draw contact and get to the line. Uh, it's just so many different elements. And it's the efficiency as well. Like we talk so much about maybe the volume of certain guys on this team, but it's just like Tyler ties into this as well because he's improving his efficiency. But Bam's sitting here just continually getting the ball down low in that spot and being efficient. Uh, that just stands out 17 boards as well against a team that we're talking about has just so much length and they're able to crash the boards. Uh, like that stuff just stands out to me, like 30 points in general. Um, I'm curious because this is the first time we were able to see him against Cleveland, obviously Jimmy as well. Yeah. I'm interested to see him against Jared Allen because I'm, I think that'll be interesting as well when they add more length, but you feel comfortable. Like I know you guys just did the pod yesterday. We're talking about the most important player in each series. Cleveland would probably be bam after what I'm watching tonight. Like just seeing the way he can just kind of counter their length and be able to do that in a way that their length can bother you on the perimeter, but he was able to kind of take advantage of it down low that it was just uh, interesting to see him take advantage of a game in general, but also we're going to look to Jimmy in that third quarter run, but bam's ability to kind of just take control of the offense just felt like the biggest uh, thing to me in that run. Yeah, no, I, I, Bam, um, there's so many things to unpack about this game for him uh, and the scoring elements of it. I just, they can't be ignored because I just think that that's something that against this team, and it just dawned on me as you were talking, Brady, that they're missing Jared Allen. I mean, how many seven foot skilled players are on one damn roster? I mean, do I have to start crediting the Cleveland Cavaliers? It looks that way, folks. Um, but you're right. I mean, for Bam, for Bam to be essentially out there on an island because Dwayne Dedman did not show up to play tonight. That was one of the weirder games I've seen from him in a while. Um, he, you know, Bam was essentially the only big and uh, and PJ was a little weird. We're going to talk about that in a second, too. So uh, so you're right. Like Bam was amongst the trees by himself and he dominated. He showed that he had the experience on on Mobley um, really like that, that kid's game, but he's not ready for Bam out of bio yet. And I think that that's encouraging to see that from him. Uh, so I hope you took the over on points for Bam out of bio on prize picks tonight. I'm going to tell you about prize picks there. It's my favorite daily fantasy app on planet earth. Uh, go to prizepicks.com. You can also find it in your uh, app store. It's daily fantasy made easy. You essentially go to the sports that you like to watch, pick your favorite players, pick your favorite stars, uh, anywhere between two and five, regardless of sport, you choose their over and under. So you look at their points, rebounds, assists, or you can look at you know other sports and the over and unders on different props and statistics. Uh, you choose those over and unders, and then you just watch and see who hits and who doesn't. You can stack those together, uh, win up to uh, 10 times your money uh, with the prize pick power play. You can do flex plays where you don't have to hit nail every single pick. But the key to this is you got to go and use the code five. That's F I V E. When you use that code, it will match your initial deposit up to a hundred dollars. So it's really that simple. You can get right in the mix. You can bet halfway through a game i think that that's super cool like quarter props and stuff like that so go to prize picks prizepicks.com use the code five to get your uh deposit matched and again that's 
prize picks code F I V E. All right, y'all. Um, let's talk about that third quarter run, Alex. Uh, cause Jimmy spearheaded it. It seemed like Jimmy was playing possum in the first half. And that was a little annoying. We needed him to get going a couple steals, a couple dunks, all of a sudden, uh, and they kept Kyle in. I thought that that was an interesting element of that run that also like that Kyle was in for the whole run. Uh, and, and then obviously Tyler comes in and continues to be rock solid. His legs look under him in a really good way heading into the playoffs. Alex, talk about the third quarter run um, and just kind of the resolve of the team in the second half because they got a couple shots thrown at them and they didn't flinch. They uh, you know, made it to the finish line with a resounding victory. Yep. And I think that's one of the things that we've been looking for all season is like, how do they respond to, you know, playing a good game and then taking a punch, right? Do they, do they continue with the same bad habits that got them there? Do they adjust? How long does it take them to adjust? And I think you've had some up and down results this season, but mostly I think just in the cr in crunch time. So not necessarily in other points throughout the game. I think uh, we've kind of seen them fight back. And so I feel pretty confident in this team to, get through those types of punches and they did it again tonight and really i think the 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 biggest thing of this game was just the defense not that it's surprising or anything that we know that the heat are a great defensive team but they today tonight was an was another awesome defensive game from the heat i think everybody for the most part was on the same page i, I think uh and brady talked about this earlier just Garland is somebody who, he, even with all the defense that he threw at him, and for as much as I've talked about the Heat will throw deep, all the defense at Garland and, and they'll struggle to score, which is kind of true tonight, um, he was still able to get to the line 16 times. So I'm sure, you know, you add Jared Allen, uh, Karis Verde to the mix, and, and it's a little bit of a closer game. But I, I this is why I've not really been too concerned about a potential Heat Cavs first-round matchup is because I think these guys are kind of still young. You know, they're, they're good. They're ahead of their time. Uh, for that kind of the timeline that they're on right now, but uh, they're still a flawed team. Like I think Garland, Garland has taken a leap. He, he's clearly really good, but the Heat were able to turn it up on defense. Jimmy was at the top of his game there in, in that third quarter, just making stuff happen. And he was really motivated to get out there and gamble for steals. So that, it's always fun. And when he gets into that mode there, um, really the fact that the, the Heat were able to generate so many looks at the rim for a team that, defends the rim the best because even though that they they specifically funnel guys to the rim on defense the Cavs do but yep, they yep. defend it the best by rim per, by, by percentage so the, the Heat were able to get there a lot and also knock down a lot I think I, I, I was just looking at it right now they finished 17 of 25 from the rim tonight so uh, just a strong game from them defensively being able to get out there in transition not getting out rebounded by by too much I think it was a, a, a deficit of two so as as much as I want to talk about Lowry by the way like uh, not doing enough offensively, the transition attack every game now is there. And that's, and Kyle Lowry is the biggest reason for that. So I, I appreciate how strong they are defensively in transition on the rebounds and just Jimmy, Bam, and Tyler just having three great games as your three best scorers. No, it's all, all super great points. Um, you know, like this is the thing with Jimmy tonight. I thought it was interesting because we keep talking about how he needs to figure it out against length you know what i mean and this is a team that was essentially throwing every player was six nine or or taller that guarded jimmy at any point um because i think even uh dean wade we're not going to say d wade on this podcast dean wade he looked like he was six nine if he ain't six nine he's damn close and uh oh shout out to ed davis that's the dude who got dunked on um by bam out of bio uh, back to our regularly scheduled program. Um, Brady, did did Jimmy show us anything tonight against the length of Cleveland that would um, that would make us feel better about heading into the playoffs against teams like maybe Milwaukee, where we've thought that this could be a bigger struggle, where we're like, how's Jimmy going to figure that out? I saw him maneuver, uh, do some things down low with some footwork and some pump fakes, but is that... Um, is that something that we can read into or kind of what was your takeaways from Jimmy's game tonight? Yeah, my takeaway is that like, I know that the length can definitely bother him, but the biggest difference is tonight he's 10 of 12 from the free throw line. And it's something I've said after these games when he's faced length, when he's sitting here like three for four from the free throw line, it comes down to him getting calls. Like we know he's going to get contact of some type, 
Uh, but if he's not getting calls and it's also against Link, it just makes it look a lot worse. Uh, tonight, may, we may be discussing Jimmy being bothered by length again if it wasn't for him getting a couple of those calls, getting 12, 10 for 12 from the free throw line. So it feels like the deciding factor for me. But either way, uh, it just comes down to him just not taking perimeter shots, mid-range jumpers. Like, it's all going to come down to him just battling down low, which is why I think he's more willing to do it in a playoff series than, like, a Friday night against Cleveland. Like, it's just, like, what it is at this point of his career. Uh like the one-legged corner three early on, like if, Ugh, if they if they it. if they lost this game, we'd be talking about that corner corner fade a lot more. But it's just it just comes down to that factor for me. Like that was the, I know you talked about like them him making moves and getting down there. I know the one play where he put like a drop step on Dean Wade, where like he yeah. turned did a turn around all the way down and laid it in. Like he has moves and maneuvers because he's quicker than a lot of these guys. Uh, I just think the issue is more of the length of a Milwaukee or a Toronto when they have guys just as fast as him, but also lengthy, that's problematic. But when there's these lengthy guys, like the game against Dallas stuck out, but those guys aren't fast enough to stick with them. If there was a potential series, which obviously we're not going to see, but it just comes down to that for me. It just comes down to getting to the line. Uh, and ultimately he's going to get there. Like we know Joel Embiid's going to get there. You know, James Harden's going to get there. Jimmy Butler's right there. He's going to get there that you just need enough of a boost that if you have Bam and Tyler playing like this, it kind of transcends a lengthy bad matchup for Jimmy just because uh, he's going to get his points just getting to the line. Yeah, that that is the key. Um, and I, I'm glad that you brought up that because it, it didn't really dawn on me how many free throws Jimmy had. Like that is the key to this length thing is to just take their ass down low and uh, get crafty enough that you draw fouls. So I, I'm totally with you there. We got a couple more guys to get to, a couple of them that were hot tonight, uh, a couple that were not, and we're going to, you know, just just glance over them. We're not going to spend too much time there. Uh, but before we do, we I got one more uh, of Five Reasons Sports and Five on the Floor, great sponsor to tell you about, and that's Water Cleanup of Florida. Are you a South Florida property owner with an insurance claim? Are you dealing with, an, with water, mold, or fire damage? Looking for a reputable, fully licensed, insured, and certified contractor? Water Cleanup of South Florida is here for you 24 hours a day. When a disaster strikes in your home or business, you need specialized, fast, and reliable service. Water Cleanup of Florida understands the impact and stress of an unexpected disaster, and they will step up to help you with over 60 years of combined experience. Michael, Robert, and the whole crew down there, they're prepared to handle any size disaster. Uh, the guys are three generation contractors in South Florida. They have uh, sterling reputation. It's extremely important to them. They've expressed that to us um, very much. So uh, their objective is to make the cleanup and insurance claim process as painless and hassle-free as it can be. So reach out to Water Cleanup of Florida. They're also a licensed building contractor, so they can really provide A to Z service. It's one-stop shop for any busy homeowner that's trying to have uh, the, the best services uh, and best contractors, they can handle it all for you. So call Michael anytime on his personal cell, 954-579-0356. That's 954-579-0356, Water Cleanup of Florida. If you got the schmutz, they got the guts. All right, so who was hot and who was not? Let's first talk about the dude who was hot. Um, and that is... Max Struess, ignitability. You mentioned it at the top of the broadcast. And um, 6 of 13, like 5 of 11 from 3. Uh, Ethan mentioned in, in our off-the-floor uh, chat that um, that's going to win them a playoff game. I, I tend to agree. I feel like that is the kind of thing that uh, the avalanche of points that you can get from a Max Struess really, really steps up and, and helps them in certain situations where they need relief buckets. Alex, um, it's too easy to just give you the Max Struess softball. So we're just going to completely go right on to PJ Tucker. And I want to know what the hell is going on with him because like, it's not just he's missing shots anymore. He's also like, now he's doing this thing where he's not shooting. Like towards the end of the game there, he kind of like did the hot potato thing with the ball a couple of times and I don't know if I should be reading more into that. What What are you seeing from PJ? Does he need a week off? I know that uh, Tim Reynolds reported what we've been all been trying to chase down for weeks. And that's when is Markeith Morris coming back? Should be any day now. Um, 
And uh, uh, Alex, I know you just uh, hit up in the chat that Oladipo is out for the back to back tomorrow. So we should we should hit on that here. But well, what's up with PJ Tucker? What, what what should I be worried? I don't know how much you should be worried. I just think he wasn't going to stay, uh, you know, above 40 percent shooter for the whole season. I, I like I think for as much as he, he stayed there and been consistent and done his thing. He's a corner shooter for a reason. Like, you don't really want him taking that many. I think there was plenty of times throughout the past two seasons before this one where the Heat would run similar offense, and instead of P.J., it was Crowder or Andre or Trevor Ariza taking those shots. And I think uh, all not, not specifically us, but a lot of us as people who watch the Heat were saying, um, you know, like, is it great that that's the shot that's open every time? Like, it gets old if there's a lot of misses, right? But – I don't, I, it could be more than just that. Cause I do think like PJ was looking at his best. I feel when Bam wasn't playing because they were kind of using Bam, um, PJ in those Bam sets and it was one less guy taking up space in the paint. They were constantly using uh, PJ in those sets. So he was, I, I feel like getting a lot of usage there as a screener and roller type of guy. And even if he wasn't always getting the floater available, he had it a lot more available to him than it is now. Whereas now I feel like he's on the floor a lot whether with Jimmy or P, I mean, or, or Bam or both, like like he he is very often. I just think it's tougher to get in a rhythm if most of the looks you're getting are really those corner threes. So I feel like a lot of the times now, those opportunities to get the, the shots inside that he was getting earlier in the season will come maybe at the end of the shot clock when they're looking for something and him and Duncan are on the same side of the floor and he goes and tries to screen for Duncan and set him up for a three. And then, you know, maybe they, they react, send two there and he gets a floater from that. But those looks, they seem like they're not coming nearly as often as they did earlier in the season when more guys were out. Yeah, look at me. I'm saying, PJ, you talked me off the ledge. I appreciate that um, with PJ Tucker because I'm saying he played hot potato and then I'm looking and he had four assists and zero turnovers. This team had nine turnovers. I'm pretty damn sure they had eight turnovers at halftime. That is um, that is a hell of a half of taking care of the basketball. Uh, and they turned the Cavs over. It was like a, I think a, a nine turnover differential. Yeah. 17 turnovers for Cleveland and they don't turn the ball over much. I mentioned uh, that, you know, there was a game against Indiana recently where they had 13 steals and only seven turnovers. It was almost like the inverse of that tonight. Um, so we're going to close as we talk about um, kind of who's hot and who's not. This is, I guess this deviates a little bit. Um, I, I want to land on Oladipo because we've now heard that he won't play. So he, I, I, I like that he got a little bit of an extended look, almost 18 minutes, right? So he's a little bit above the, the minutes restriction that, that Spolstra had initially put out there. Brady, what did you see from Depot? Um, but more than that, I'd like your perspective on how Gabe handles this kind of situation. I think it's super interesting. Like, he is Gabe just like we were just talking about Gabe being like a, a mainstay in the playoff rotation. Like he could not leave the rotation. Like that's how good he was playing. And now yeah. he's kind of shelved and you're seeing them work depot in. Um, but this is a game where now you have maintenance. Gabe gets to step back in and has another role. So it's interesting to watch Spo navigate that. But what did you see from depot on the defensive end tonight that you liked? Uh, if anything, and then um, just, uh, uh I guess, is this a situation where you think it's going to be that Gabe truly is on the shelf while Depot is back? Or is this just they're trying to get Depot as many reps ahead of the playoffs? Yeah, I think, well, first of all, with Caleb out, like, I didn't see a way Gabe would slot in this one because this is just a terrible match. That's a good for him. point. Like, this lengthiest team in the league, it's hard to see them just go. Uh, we see the Kyle, Tyler, Depot lineups, but it's just hard to see Gabe slot in there as well. Uh, in terms of Oladipo, like there's a lot of things you could discuss of his small stints of minutes. But the thing that stands out to me is when I think about his defense, I always thought of him as like a strictly on ball threat. Like that was kind of where he thrived. Like his help in rotations have been like really, really, really good. Uh, like he's always slotting over. Uh, think about the first defensive possession of him in a heat uniform this season. He slotted over to get the charge. It feels like he's doing that every time because his basically the guy he's guarding is always in that weak side corner. It feels like that he's always just waiting, coming over, uh, even if it ends up in a basket at the end of it. Like it's still perfect positional defense that he's playing that uh, we know 
you know, you could hear him in these post game pressers that he's a high IQ guy, like that. He's just a smart individual, but he is such a high IQ defender. Like he just knows where to be in those spots. And I feel like we were having these all the all the depot podcasts before his game. And we were like, the defense is what's going to keep him on the floor. Like you th- there's going to be offensive rust. Everything's going to come along there, but it matters immediately how much is he going to be locked in defensively? And I feel like he's at that level. Like we saw reps in that first game where he was kind of on guys on the ball, but just seeing this off ball stuff uh, just really stands out to me. And I do think to tie it into Gabe that he's him and Max are kind of at the same point right now. Like they kind of have their rotation at this point that they're just going to be sparks in ways. They're going to be fillers in many ways that we see when Caleb goes out that they kind of had a weird little spot in the back, in the front court, that that'll be Marquise's role. If all the depot maybe has something happen and he's not playing up to par, Gabe Vincent and Max Schroes are going to be sitting there. Like they have options uh, that I don't, I just can't see them going 10. Like we had this discussion a lot that maybe they go 10 in the first round or maybe the second round. I just can't see them going 10 at any point because they don't feel, he doesn't feel comfortable going 10 on a Friday night against Cleveland. That it just exactly. feels unlikely to me. Um, but this is the rotation to me. I feel like Caleb is for so long, we've said as a lock and then just seeing him go out in the role that he played on this team when he's not there, like he's definitely a lock. Even like you're mentioning the marquee for turn, like Caleb solidified himself in this rotation to show what he means to this team. Uh, that it is just a weird spot for Gabe, but uh, down the stretch of the season, there's going to be slots for him at least over this next few weeks of the regular season for him to play. Like we're already tomorrow with all, all the depot out. Uh, you mentioned PJ maybe getting a rest week. He could possibly slot in uh, to the rotation there. I think there's going to be points where maybe Jimmy or Kyle takes a couple games off in the last few, maybe the last week or two, uh, that there'll be opportunities in that sense, but just re- playoff wise, it just seems really hard to get to that point. No, it's, it, it, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, it's a tough problem. It's a good problem to have. To, I mean, the Heat have not been this deep ever. And I, I, I'll just, I'm saying it again out loud so that I can get it out as many times this season as possible. They are, this is the deepest team I've ever seen them have. Um, and it's interesting that Caleb, he wanted to play. They, they essentially said that, um, that he was going to, that he wanted to warm up and he wanted to try to give it a go. And that the fact that he could even respond in that way was a real positive. So um, I think that that is, that that's a really good sign for him to be back. Then you got Markeith Morris coming back. So I do think that they're going to have an opportunity to get PJ Tucker some rest. And I think he needs it. And I'll close here. Uh, I think it's really it's telling that we get through this entire episode of a Miami heat victory. And we really can just skate through the episode and we don't even discuss boy wonder going eight of 15, 22 points, 33 minutes. Um, I think he showed everybody who the six man of the year award should go to tonight as Kevin love the, the advanced metric favorite was on the floor at the same time. Um, and Tyler kind of spearheaded some great stuff for the heat in the second half. So it's really good when Tyler hero looks that good, uh, to, to finish a game. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we, we'll, we will be back throughout the weekend as the heat play the Minnesota Timberwolves tomorrow night. Um, so, uh, either you'll hear from us at post game tomorrow night or, uh, for your Monday morning drive into work. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for listening to the five on the floor on the five regional sports network.